I'm interviewing uh, Dr. William Fogarty um, this morning. Uh, the date is um, March 12th, uh, 2021. Dr. Fogarty has uh, uh, been active in the American College of Physicians for many years. He was elected to mastership last year. Um, he's been a longtime prominent practitioner uh, of internal medicine in St. Louis. And although he uh, has retired from the his own personal private practice. He continues to volunteer as a, a clinician at indigent healthcare clinics, uh, and um, and has also in his um, retirement become even more active in social justice issues and uh, governmental uh, activities. Uh, he, he's been an act, active member of the American College of Physicians for many years. He became a fellow in 1993, and as I alluded to, a master in, in 2020. Good morning, Dr. Fogarty. Good morning, Dan. So can you tell me a little bit about, you know, uh, where you came from? Uh, where were you born? And what did, what, where did you grow up? What did your folks do? Yes, uh, I was born in St. Louis. Uh, my parents lived in Pine Lawn when I was born and moved to University City when I was about five. And so I basically grew up in University City. Uh, my parents, my mother was a librarian. She graduated from the library school at the uh, St. Louis uh, Central Library. They used to have a school there and uh, was a librarian at the Bar Branch on Jefferson and, uh, and 44 um, in St. Louis. Uh, my father was an insurance broker and financial planner for people. Uh, ne neither one had any science or medicine backgrounds, uh, whatever. And uh, uh, I had rather, I guess, a, an idyllic growing up in University City. It was a great place to grow up. And uh, we had a lot of freedom and a lot of fun and, uh, and uh, took part in a lot of activities uh, in the community. What made you decide to become a doctor? What I'd uh, say, since neither your position, neither of your parents were in healthcare, what influenced you? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, I think about that a lot. I have one older cousin who's now dead, but he he was a professor of surgery. He was a transplant surgeon. He was a professor at the uh, University of Arizona. He was one of the founding members of the University of Arizona Medical School. And um, we had one neighbor uh, John Hammond was a, a cardiologist uh, in St. Louis. Uh, uh, he was uh, he was sort of the neighborhood father. Uh, most of the parents, including my father, uh, were in the service in World War II, and uh, there were very few men around. And John Hammond uh, was a wonderful gentleman who was uh, kind of the neighborhood father, and uh, he was uh, a, a, a wonderful role model. He wrote my letter. Uh, recommendation for medical school. So I guess it, I guess he said something nice about me. I don't know. Um, but uh, I, where I got the idea, I'm not I'm not real sure. <laughs> you recall how old you were when you decided? I think in high school. Uh, I loved uh, math and science. Uh, our high school had no biology, believe it or not. We had physics and chemistry, but no biology. So I had no biology till I got to college. But I sort of decided in, in high school that I wanted to go to pre-med and try to get in medical school. I have to ask you the uh, classic St. Louis question. What, where did you go to high school? St. Louis U High. I had no imagination. I went to St. Louis U High, St. Louis U College, St. Louis U Med School, St. Louis U Internship, and then I decided to move on from there. <laughs> Given that background, I'm surprised you didn't become a Jesuit father. Uh, not a chance. <laughs> I became a father, but not a Jesuit father. <laughs> what, what, uh, what, what caused you to choose internal medicine? Well, you know, I think uh, I read a, an article once saying that there was a high probability that you would go into the specialty of your first clinical rotation in medical school. And somebody had gone to the trouble to look at that and found out that I, I don't remember the percentage, but it was a distorted high percentage. Uh, went into the whatever their first rotation was. Well, my first rotation was internal medicine at Old City Hospital as a junior student. And uh, it was uh, quite an experience, as you can imagine. And uh, 
and uh, I loved it and got interested there. I think beyond that, I think I enjoyed I enjoyed problem solving. I enjoyed uh, uh, detective work, I guess you call it, and I I was very interested in uh, mechanisms of of disease and mechanisms of uh, chemical processes and so forth. And so I, I think all that kind of tips it toward internal medicine. But, uh, what was, uh, I'd like to know a little bit of what medical school was like. What year was this? Uh, what, what was your first year? I graduated in 1960. 1960. So um, what did you do as a medicine clerk? Uh, you, you said that was your first clinical rotation at the old St. Louis City Hospital. What was your, what was your day like? Was it mostly working? Were there lectures? Oh, I think it was about 95 and five. Uh, there were a few conferences and mostly work. Uh, the junior student, of course, was the lowest man on the totem pole. And uh, we got assigned all the, all the duties, you know, drawing blood, starting IVs. Uh, we had to do uh, the CBCs and urinalyses were done in a little lab on the, on the ward. And uh, we had to do those and uh, learn how to do, you know, a little uh, hemocytometer, a little uh, slide and count, count red cells in the squares and all that stuff. And uh, uh, there were nights we were on call, I think it was every third, and there were nights there where there were no nurses and no attendants on the ward. And the ward was 42 people in two rooms, 21 in each room. And so the junior students stayed up all night and, you know, did whatever had to be done. Emptied bedpans, uh, calmed down upset people, uh, passed out meds, started IVs, uh, Whatever had to be done, the junior students did it. It was uh, an incredible experience. And, did you do your own uh, bacteriologic stains? Pardon me? Did you do your own bacteriologic stains in your little ward lab? Um, stains, AFBs? You know, I think, I think maybe we did. Yeah, I can remember heating some glass slides up to fix a stain and whatever. Yeah, we did some of that too, yeah. But why, why were there no nurses at night at City Hospital? Was it well, it was City Hospital. Uh, it was, uh, you know, if, if I guess if somebody showed up for work or somebody was assigned, they were there. And if, if they weren't, they weren't, you know. And uh, and uh, some nights are, we, that didn't happen, but it happened often enough. And, uh, we had either rotations were three months. So you, you had a, a pretty long dip into the into the world of reality there. You said there were two 24 bed wards. Uh, was one male and one female? No, no, no. Uh, uh, there are four. There were four floors of internal medicine. Washington U had two, and St. Louis U had two, and one was male and one was female. Uh, uh, the, of the four floors, I mean, one of each service was male right. and one was female. Right, right. So, uh, what was your tuition? The uh, first two years was nine hundred dollars. And the second two years was eleven $1 hundred dollars. So, uh, by comparison, what would a a Volkswagen Beetle have cost at the time, or an equivalent car? Mm, let me guess. I think a Beetle was about fifteen hundred dollars. So, something like give so or take. Tuition was less less than half of the cost of a small car. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did, did, you, did you work outside of school? Did you work to earn money outside of outside of your uh, medical school work? Well, during the summer, uh, each year I got a, a fellowship to work in the biochemistry department at St. Louis U. I worked in uh, Dr. Ted Doisy's lab and um, and uh, had a wonderful time there. Really got introduced to laboratory work and so forth. Uh, when I was in college and also my first year of medical, after first year of medical school, I ran the swimming pool at Bell Reef Country Club. I was the, the, the head lifeguard and so forth. And uh, so it was kind of tough that one, that first summer in med school, because I was working in the lab and I had to be out at Bell Reef at, at, by about 4.30. It was, there was two shifts and I, I would take the night evening shift like 4.30 to 10 every day to keep the pool open. And, uh, so I had to kind of sneak out of the lab uh, about four o'clock to to race out to Old Bell Reeve, which is where Umsel is now, sure. and uh, and uh, so I made uh, two hundred dollars a month at Bell Reeve, and uh, I don't know if 
I guess we got paid in the lab with biochemistry, but I, I honestly, if, if we did, it was uh, not any more than that. That's for sure. You know, a couple hundred bucks at the most. Was that, was that the, was that the Dr. Doisy that won the Nobel prize? No, it was his son. His son. Dr. Doisy was the chairman of the department and his son, uh, Edward uh, Jr., everybody called him Ted, was uh, uh, a, uh, in, in the biochemistry department. He was a physician, not a, not a PhD, but he was biochemist. So what was your social life like? Well, uh, I met my wife, uh, uh, I guess, probably my second year of college. And um, we got married after my second year of medical school. I only went to college for three years. I got in medical school after three years. And so I do not have a degree. I'm uh, considered illiterate. And uh, 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 my Father Marchetti was the Dean of the Arts and Science School, he was a, just a wonderful gentleman. His door was always open. You just, you just walk in and sit out in his office and shoot the breeze with him, you know? And, and uh, he knew I wasn't the happiest college student in the world. I was, I was ready to move on. And, and one day he said, why don't you just go to med school next year? And I said, what? I, you know, I got another year of college. He said, just, just, just go, just go. And, and so uh, that put the bee in my bonnet and I applied and, and uh, got in. And um, so I was, I was quite ready to move on to medical so school. Were you, were you, uh, were you um, uh, a minority in your medical school class and being married? Well, there were quite a few married students because this was this was post post uh, um, Korean War, and a lot of several of our classmates had had been you know drafted after uh, after college or during college uh, to go to Korea, and then they came back and finished their pre med and started med school. We started in fifty six, <clears throat> so a number of them were older and. Uh, had some of them had several kids before they started med school. Uh, um, a number, I don't know what percentage were married, but uh, I got married after second year and that was not, it was not rare. There were a good number. Did, did, did your social life then um, revolve around your married classmates? Uh, Pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, I, moved, I, uh, we moved, our first apartment was this uh, uh, roach infested place on South Grand uh, and uh, our, our first child was born at, at the at the end of my third year, about a little over a little less than a year after we got married, and uh, we moved from there to Peabody Housing Project down behind City Hospital, and oh uh, there were a lot of, of med students and house officers living there at the time, and uh, it was it was actually fun, you know. We uh, it was kind of like a big a big party all the time, and uh, the wives. It was mostly wives stuck at home with kids, and because uh, we had very few women in our class, uh, so the wives entertained each other when we were working every other night or every third night to, through uh, senior year and internship. Do, do you recall what percentage of your class was uh, female? Uh, I think out of we started with 125 in the class. Uh, I think there were six women. Two of them were nuns, and um, uh, the attrition rate was atrocious. Uh, of, of that 125, 92 graduated, and we picked up six from the class before who d dropped back a year, so we actually had 98 graduates, but uh, only 92 out of 125 uh, uh, of the those that started. What was the cause of the attrition? Uh, a lot of things. Um, there was a lot of unfairness and a, a lot of just horrible stuff happened. And uh, um, uh, one guy's wife hated St. Louis and, and he struggled through a year and a half of med school and they went home for Christmas the second year and she refused to come back. So he, so he didn't come back either. <laughs> and uh, one guy, one of the pathology professors didn't like him for some reason and just tortured the guy and, and made him drop back a year, flunked him 
in pathology. And he, he was a good student and, and smart and capable and and uh, he was just abused. There's a lot of, and another, another one uh, uh, didn't do real well on the pathology exam and was told that she could take it over at the end of the summer. And if she passed, she could move on with the class. And she, she studied 12 hours a day, seven days a week for the whole summer, took the pathology exam, got 100% on it, and was told you still have to take the year over. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I mean, uh, wow, that's uh, was, uh, so. So, <laughs> yeah, things have certainly changed. You know, I know in the fifties there are residency programs that discouraged and, in some cases, prohibited their house staff from being married. Did, did your did your marital status impact on your ability to obtain postgraduate training? No. no. Well, in one way, uh, an internship. Married students were paid $125 a month, and the single students were only paid 100 And that created a lot of animosity, because the single guys said, you know, why the hell should I subsidize your, <laughs> you being married? You know? And there was a lot of craziness like that, you know. Did you, did you receive any other, uh, any other benefits? Did you get meals, uniforms? Oh, yeah. You could, you could, get, you could eat all you could eat in the hospital cafeteria. And uh, my wife and daughter would come uh, occasionally, not often, but come for dinner. And, and I would take a tray and I would pile it up about this high. And my wife would take a tray and get a glass of tea <laughs> and pay a dime or whatever. And then we'd all eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. what, uh, what, what challenges did you personally have in medical school, if you're thinking back on it? Um, not a lot. I, I, I kind of pretty, had a pretty good time. I had a, a few run-ins with, with professors. Uh, um, one of the interesting things, before our senior year, the chairman of medicine was fired <clears throat> and he left and went to, uh, went back to Hopkins. He'd come from Hopkins and he went back to Hopkins. Was that Phil Tumulty? Yes. And he took the entire house staff with him. So there were no interns and, and almost no residents. And Dr. Wegria came in and took his, took his position. And I love Dr. Wegria. That's why I stayed for internship because I thought Rene Wegria was one of the most incredible physicians I'd ever met. And anyway, so my senior year, we were acting interns and we had responsibilities and, and, and duties way beyond what any medical student has these days. And uh, it, was, it was a powerful experience. Uh, and by the time we got to internship and when I went on to the University of Minnesota residency, I mean, we were, we were, we were up and running. We, we, could, we could do most anything. You know, it, was, uh, it was pretty incredible. And uh, what made you choose to what made you choose to, to, to leave St. Louis and go to Minnesota? Well, I think I'd just been there too long, you know, and um, I was I was looking for something else, I guess. And I looked around all around the country. My wife and I took a trip uh, all through the east and look, looked at a whole bunch of different places and uh, and uh, decided to like Minnesota the best. And uh, I, um, it was a good choice. It was, it was a fantastic, fantastic place. Uh, C.J. Watson was the chairman of medicine and he was quite a, quite a grand old man. And, uh, and uh, it was, there was very good faculty, very good clinical teaching. I spent most of my first year there at the university, at the uh, VA in uh, Minneapolis. And uh, so there was a lot of full-time faculty uh, staff at the VA who were, were very good. We had a lot of responsibility uh, ourselves, but but there was always somebody there when you when you needed them. Did your salary go up when you became a resident at uh, in uh, two, Minneapolis? Two twenty five. All right. Bucks, but my rent was one thirty five. Went up from thirty five dollars at Peabody to one hundred thirty five to this little place we rented in uh, in uh, Minneapolis. So it was a struggle, believe me. I bet. 
Was, was, did your wife work outside the home or, or uh, you on your salary? She worked till, till Kathy was born, then she quit. So she would, no, and she did not work after I became a senior student. And, uh, and uh, I, I got a, uh, my father was an insurance broker and he hooked me up doing insurance exams. Uh -huh. And and it was ten bucks a ten bucks a copy, and um, I would save them up, and I would go out uh, like one night a week when we lived in Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, and I would line up maybe six or eight of these things, and drive all over God's Green Acres, um, uh, you know, doing insurance physicals, and uh, that that kind of uh, kept us uh, alive while I was a resident. What, uh, I, I assume you had to do that when you weren't on call. What was, what was your call schedule like when you were a resident? Uh, that, that's one of the good things. <laughs> at at St. Louis U, uh, it was every third on medicine and every other on surgery. At Minnesota, it was every ninth. Wow, how did they manage that? I don't know. <laughs> and when, when you were on, I mean, when you were on, you were on because the, the VA, I think, if I remember right, it had 330 beds and there'd be two of us, maybe three of us on it a night. You were covering the whole, the whole, sh the whole shop. So uh, it was, uh, it was busy, <laughs> but it was only every night. So, you know, how, how much can that hurt? You know, <laughs> so what was your supervision like? Did, did you have faculty that you could call on if you got in trouble or you got over your head or did you go to the chief resident or how did it work? I mean, at, the, at Minnesota? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, it was a great, a great group of residents. They, they were really outstanding. And um, uh, I still remember finally, the chief resident was Malcolm Blumenthal. And Malcolm was just an incredible guy. He, he was the chief resident, then he went on and became a rheumatologist. But but uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things I'll never forget, I was on call on Christmas and I had three little kids and nobody was happy about me not being home. I mean, I would not be home at all. I'd be at the hospital all, all the whole time. About a week before Christmas, Mal Malcolm came into my office. We each had an office. Malcolm came in and said, uh, do you have a minute to talk? And, and I said, sure. He said, you're out on Christmas, aren't you? And I said, yeah. He said, "Don't worry about it. I'm going. I'm going to cover the whole hospital." And uh, wow. he he let all the other residents off, and, and he he covered the whole hospital. I thought, man, what a, what a guy, you know, that, what a guy. My goodness. Well, what was it? You know, with you cover with you having that few uh, residents in the hospital at night, what was a call night like? What, 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 how many admissions would you take? Um, you know, it, it wasn't so much admissions. It was just sort of putting out fires. Uh, the admissions were were mostly daytime, you know, and and uh, uh, it came. Most of them came through the through what's called the emergency room, which was not exactly an acute care emergency room at the VA. It was more sort of a triage office. You know, people show up there and they decide whether or not they needed to be in the hospital. And uh, yeah, I and, recall that. I think they used to call the the admitting and discharge office when I was yeah. when I was in, in yeah. the room. Yeah. So it, it the the admissions at night, you certainly got them, but it, it wasn't like you'd get twelve in a night or something. You know, it was a, a, a few. Did you go over to the university hospital more the next year? Yes, second year. And what was that like? What was the workload there like? Um, not a lot different. Um, the University of Minnesota Hospital had a unique system. Um, you had to be referred there by a practicing state of Minnesota physician. You couldn't, you couldn't just show up at the door. And uh, so the, the, the patient being sent, was being sent there it was not acutely ill usually. It was not, you know, life and death situation. They came to an admitting office where they're examined by a student, a resident, uh, and, and an attending. And then a decision was made, yeah, we're gonna admit this patient and do whatever, or no, they don't need to be admitted. We can take care of this as an outpatient or whatever. So 
it was it was pretty controlled uh, how the um, patients were admitted to the hospital. And, it was, uh, uh, was the work distribution similar to St. Louis University where the majority of the simple laboratory tests were done by students and interns? No, not up there at all. I, I don't think we did I don't think we did any uh, laboratory work at, at, at either at the VA or at uh, at the university that I remember anyway. So you have you have people that looking back on it, you think as being particularly influential or being role models to what you chose to do subsequently. Oh, absolutely. Um, as I mentioned before, I think Renee Wegria was was one of the ones. Renee was a was a interesting character. He was from Belgium. Uh, he had come to Columbia, New York. Uh, he was a cardiopulmonary physiologist. He was with Kernand and Richards, I'll bet. I, I don't know. They, I don't know. I, I don't want to, you know, be telling stories of my own, but, you know, that lab at Bellevue was the Kornand and Richards lab, which basically, they called themselves a cardiopulmonary uh, unit, and they spawned Fishman, who went to Philadelphia and did the same thing, and and so on, and it's where you know a lot of original cardiac catheterization work was done. Yeah, well, Renee, Renee knew more medicine than anyone I ever have met. He he not only knew cardiology cold, he would listen to somebody's heart before they were catheterized, and he'd say the the pressure across the pulmonary valve is such and such, the pressure across the aortic valve is such and such, and and. and and by God, it was just, I mean, it was like perfect every time. And and he, we had, uh, he made rounds twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And the interns picked the patient. And no, you didn't tell anyone who, who you picked. You didn't even tell your resident who you picked. And, and so Wegri had no way of knowing what he was gonna walk into that day. And he would come up on the floor and we would have some esoterica, you know, having nothing to do with cardiology and he would just ace it. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, you know, hepatitis or pancreatitis or, you know, whatever it was, he, he would nail it. And I, I, I still can't imagine how he had the breadth and depth of knowledge uh, that he had. It was, uh, it was incredible. And who else? Uh, there was a practitioner in town, uh, a pulmonologist named Herb Sweet, who was just an incredible gentleman. And he was my attending a couple of times when I was a student and maybe when I was an intern. And, and just, just his approach to patients and his uh, caring for patients and his knowledge and so forth were just beautiful. And uh, he, was, he was sort of my ideal of the, of the LMD, you know, the, the practicing physician. He he was the best, and uh, and uh, my father went to him. I, I guess I probably sang there, and they became sort of best friends. And they he would he would always make my father's appointment the last one in the day, and then they sit and shoot the breeze for about an hour after, and he's taking care of them. And so they he he was uh, he was wonderful, and uh, the Doisies also. Uh, not in, not in clinical medicine, but in biochemistry were really important to me. Ted was a wonderful mentor, taught me an awful lot about laboratory medicine and so forth, laboratory uh, work in biochemistry. And his father was by that time very old and senior, but just a wonderful gentleman, incredibly smart. And he, he taught me something very important. He, he would wander into the lab once or twice a week and he, he'd be puffing on his pipe and he'd say, uh, are you having fun? And you'd say, "Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing this and that, and I'm really enjoying it." And he'd say, "Well, keep at it," and he'd leave. You know, that was it. And if he came in and he'd say, "Are you having fun?" And he'd say, "No, sir. I'm this, this not working out, and I don't know what's happening here." And blah blah blah. He'd say, "Well, let's sit down and talk about that, and let's figure it out." <laughs> he'd sit down and solve your problem for you. <laughs> and I, I, look, I use that on my kids a lot when you know when they were older and in school. I'd say, "Do you have fun today?" And if they said yes, I figured, well, they're probably doing okay. You know, <laughs> if they were, oh, yeah, you know, then I'd say, well, let's talk about what's wrong. You know? <laughs> uh, so, um, what what happened after you finished residency? What did you do next? Well, 
I switched while, while I was a resident of Minnesota out of our $335 or $235 salary, we had to pay $30 a month tuition. Uh, all, all house officers at the University of Minnesota are considered graduate students. And so if, if you notice some of the people who've done their training at Minnesota have MS and something or a PhD and something uh, because they were, they were graduate students also. And, and so I figured if I'm gonna pay them 30 bucks, I'm gonna take the course. And so you could sign up for anything you wanted to take. And so I, I always took a course and I'd have to drive from the VA up to the university. It's about maybe 15 minute drive to go to class for these courses three times a week. I just sneak out of the hospital and go take my, take my, listen to the lecture. But one of the ones I took was steroid biochemistry with somebody named Frank Unger. And I just love the course. It was, it was fantastic. And I learned the chemistry of steroids and all the enzymes and all the stuff. And, and so after the course was over, I, I went and talked to Frank and I said, you know, is there any chance that I could come into your lab as a as a graduate student and work on a PhD? And he said, sure. So uh, he got me something called, he had a program of his own called uh, um, Fellowship in Steroid Biochemistry. And he had a grant to pay salary. So he paid me something the first year. And then I got an NIH postdoctoral fellowship uh, for the rest of the time. And uh, that paid that paid $9,000 tax-free. So we bought a house, we had two cars, we had five kids, we had symphony tickets, we had theater tickets, we, you know, it was like, it was like we were really living the life, you know, <laughs> for, for 9,000 bucks a year, plus my insurance exams on the side. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I spent uh, a good amount of time with Frank and, and came within a whisker of my get, getting a PhD. I was working on my thesis and uh, about finished. And uh, I had had an arrangement with this woman in the draft board in, in St. Louis County where I was registered. Uh, she was very good to me and, and she would uh, call me a couple of times a year and tell me where I stood on the draft because this was the uh, Vietnam era. And uh, she'd say, you're okay, you know, keep going. You're okay, okay. Then she called me and said, uh, your number's up, but you know, uh, and so I, I couldn't finish my thesis and I, I, I joined the public health service. So instead of going in the military, I, I got a commission in the public health service. Uh, uh, so I left Minnesota without my PhD. I'm an ABD and uh, uh, that's one of the great regrets of my life, but that's, that's reality. Did you go to Bethesda then? I did, I went to NIH for three years. Uh, I worked with somebody there named Harvey Yatano, who uh, is just also one of the greatest people I've ever known. Har Harvey was a Japanese American who was scheduled to graduate from Berkeley in the spring of 1942. And a month before graduation, they jerked him out of school and sent him to a concentration camp. And uh, so he was number one in his class at Berkeley and the, the commencement address that year was given about Harvey and how unfair it was that an American citizen, extremely brilliant man, was you know jerked out of school to be put in a concentration camp. And anyway, he, his one of his uh, professors at um, Berkeley found out that you could get out of the concentration camp if you went to school in the Midwest. And that man was a friend of Dr. Doisy's. And he called Dr. Doisy and said he had this extremely brilliant young man who was locked up and, and, uh, and he could get out if he came to medical school. <laughs> so Doisy said, send him. So Harvey gets out of the camp and shows up at med school, had never applied, had never been officially admitted or anything. And school had started two weeks before. And he walks in and, and, and he's a first year med student at St. Louis U. So he finished his uh, medical school and he, he really wanted to be a, a chemist, not a physician, but he did an internship. And, and then he came back to St. Louis and talked to Dr. Doisy again and said, um, I wanna go to graduate school, where should I go? And Dr. Doisy said, you should go uh, with Linus Pauling at Caltech. And um, so he gets, picks up the phone and calls Linus Pauling and, 
and Pauling says, send him out. So Harvey arrives at Caltech, never applied, never admitted, but became a graduate student there. He got his PhD from Pauling. And uh, he wrote the, 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 an incredible paper. I have it. It's one column in Science Magazine. Uh, the electrophoretic separation of sickle cell hemoglobin. And, and he, he um, and Pauling Atano Singer and Wells is on the paper, um, uh, showed that the, the difference between S and A. And, uh, and the last line of that paper is, this, this is a, an introduction to molecular biology. <laughs> So anyway, he, he finished his PhD and went to NIH. And uh, when, you, when you try to go to NIH, you, 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 um, you just put on your CV or whatever, you know, where do you want to go in the public health service? And I just put one thing. I just put NIH. I didn't put anything else. And they, they circulate your CV uh, through labs that have openings. And Harvey saw mine and saw that I was from St. Louis <laughs> and, and called me up and he said, do you want a job? <laughs> said, I, he said, you know, what are you working on? I told him I was doing steroid biochemistry. And he said, he said, well, I'm a protein chemist. And I said, well, I said, I took one course in protein chemistry in my graduate work, but I, I know that's all I know. You know, he said, don't worry, I'll teach you whatever you need to know. So he had me come up and spend a week with him and while I was there, I, he gave me a stack of papers to read and, and, uh, and he gave me time to go find a house to rent and so forth. And uh, I came back to Minnesota and packed up my family and moved to, moved to Maryland. And, was, he, was, he in, was he in the clinical center, his lab in the clinical center or was it one of the outlying buildings? Building two. Building two. Yep, building, room. Building two room, my lab was 202, and I'm in part, apartment 202 now, so maybe it's some fate there. <laughs> where, where did you guys live, in that neighborhood west of the campus? No, we lived in Rockville. Rockville. Uh, Randolph, uh, Randolph, Randolph Road, very nice area. It was terrific. Great schools for the kids and so forth. So uh, how did you decide uh, to come back to St. Louis rather than staying at the NIH for the rest of your career? Well, I'm not sure that was an option. I stayed an extra year. I stayed three years instead of two. Uh, Harvey was getting ready to retire and he didn't want to bring any more young people into his lab and then leave on them. So uh, he asked me would I like to stay a third year. So I, I jumped at that for sure. I looked at a lot of jobs. Um, I looked at UCSD and Hopkins and Columbia, New York. And I can't remember where all. Um, and um, we just decided we wanted to come back to St. Louis. Our families were here. Our parents were getting old, and and um, uh, they offered me a assistant professorship in, in medicine, and uh, I took it and uh, came back uh, on the full time faculty at St. Louis U. Uh, if I recall, you know, if I recall correctly, during my time, the NIH was paying about twice what residencies paid. Did you get a did you did you get a bump in salary when you were in Bethesda? Oh well, well I was on a postdoc at nine thousand tax free. I, I I think I think I made fifteen five at at uh, as a public health officer, uh, if I remember that right. And then of course we had the commissary and the right all the all the perks that go with it. You know, so you go over to Walter Reed to get your milk. No. Uh, uh, we went to uh, Fort Meade, I think it was, or is that the one over in Virginia? I think that's right. No, Fort Meade. Fort Meade is uh, is where the is up in Maryland, where I think the. Oh, that's not Maine. right then. It was this was in this was somewhere near Arlington. Maybe Fort Belvoir. No, yeah, I can't remember. I I went there. My wife and I went there once, and she said she'd never go back. It was this mammoth place, you know, and very confusing. And so, I would go once a month. We had a, a we had a Ford station wagon, big big behemoth, and uh, I would get four carts. You had to be there when it opened, and, and the carts were outside. Yeah, I'd grab four carts, and we I made a map of the place where everything was, and and my wife would 
write on the map, you know, so many of this and what of that and so forth. I'd fill all four carts and, and uh, it would fill the entire back of the station wagon. <laughs> and and uh, I'd drive home and I'd unload it all in the kitchen and I'd say goodbye and go to work, you know. I'd, and I'd, So I'd be at work by 9.30. I'd, you know, I'd spend, it was 150 bucks to fill, totally fill the car with groceries. And, uh, and uh, that was. What would that did. cost if you had to go to the, the local grocery store, do you think? Oh, I have no idea. It would have been several times that, I'm sure, because yeah. everything was so cheap, you know. Yeah, I had a, five, five kids to feed. You know? <laughs> I had a colleague that was in a similar circumstance to yours, and, and they used to go over to the commissary at Walter Reed and look, do the same thing, load up. They, they, yeah. They buy milk basically by the barrel. You know, yeah. and load, load, load the back of their station wagon with gallons and gallons of milk. <laughs> so, so when you came back, so you came back, you came back to St. Louis University, and you were on the full time faculty for a while. But what were you doing? Were you just, were, were, did you open a lab? Well, it was a, no, no. I had no. I had well, it's an interesting story. I I had been away from clinical medicine for like eight years, and and I had. At NIH, I used to go on rounds. They had uh, rounds in, in the clinical center. I, I'd go on that, uh, particularly endocrine rounds occasionally, and I'd go to various conferences, but I had no patient care experience at all. The first thing that they did, they they made me the ward chief. There were three medicine floors at St. Louis and they made me the, the ward chief or whatever it was on one of the floors. So I just, I was dumped in right off the hook and uh, um, what um, what I did I decided I was gonna I was gonna get myself back in clinical medicine in a big hurry and I would see every patient before rounds and I would see every new admission before rounds and I'd read like a fiend every night <laughs> and so by, by the time I got the, the rounding on those patients I, I was pretty much up to speed by by the end of the year, I'd, I'd had sort of a super chief resident year, I guess you'd call it. And, uh, and it, was, it was very valuable. I, I was also put in charge of the endocrine lab. Uh, there was a service lab there that was uh, very sophisticated, did all the endocrine testing for the university. And uh, we had very good um, chemists and uh, biochemists in the lab. And I was in charge of that. and. Um, oversaw what they were doing. And um, I would do all the, uh, we did uh, various kinds of infusions uh, uh, and then testing for whatever hormones. Um, I would do all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I helped develop uh, a number of new tests. You know, we needed a test for whatever. I would do some research on it and and get that up and running and turn it over to the techs to actually do the, do the uh, clinical stuff. So it was a, it was a hellacious year. I mean, I was, I was working, uh, you know, many, many hours and, uh, and I got a lot out of it. Uh, I decided though, that this was not my future. <laughs> and uh, the chairman of the department and I uh, didn't see, shall we say, didn't see eye to eye on everything. It'd be a nice way to put it. And, um, uh, Who was that, Bill? Um, Tom Frawley. Tom was a diff very difficult, very difficult man. But anyway, um, I was at a meeting um, in about April of that first year and ended up sitting next to a guy who was two years ahead of me in medical school and had been one of my residents when I was an intern, uh, Jim McCool. And I hadn't seen Jim in years. And, and uh, he, he I told him what I was doing. He said, you ever think about going into practice? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm really thinking about that right now. And I actually had taken a couple of trips looking at places. And uh, he said, well, we're looking for somebody at Southwest. Why don't you come join us? And uh, so I looked into that and I joined them and uh, spent 30 years there. And uh, very happy, happy practice. And Jim and I were partners for 28 and a half years uh, and uh, could, not, could not have had a better partner. We were... Uh, totally compatible, never had, I, when he left, uh, when he retired, he, I told him, Jim, something wrong with us. We've never had an argument, you know? 
So, and, 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 no, I'm interested to know how your practice changed over that time. When you know you you came in, that would have been what around 1970 or 1971. Thereabouts? 71. 71. So, and so Medicare was in place already. Yeah. Uh, I, how how did your practice and the way you ran it and the finances and so on change over the time you were in practice? Well, uh, a hell of a lot. Um, when I started, I was paid twenty two five, which was a, a thousand more than I was making at St. Louis U. Um, the full partners made forty five. Every everybody everybody was the same, and uh, you were supposed to work up from twenty two five to. Four, 45 over a five-year period and after the end of my about the, toward the end of my second year I built up my practice such that I was I was the third most productive member of the whole group there were there, was a, there were like 18 internists in the group it was a big group and uh, so I said at the meeting one night he said I, I'm tired of not making full 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 pay because I'm doing more than my share you know and so they jumped me up to 45 right away and did uh buy in? did you have to buy into the practice to do that yeah yeah they it paid i you bought in so much a month for so long i don't remember the numbers and i think it was twenty five thousand or something like that total to, to buy in. um and we went along like that for for a good while and then we started you know we had a meeting every month and looked at everybody's numbers and originally the the spread in, in productivity <coughs> was very narrow. Everybody was putting in about the same amount of work. And then it, then it started doing this, you know, and about half the group was really productive and about half the group was just coasting. And so Jim McCool and I sort of had a coup and we, uh, we took over and um, we put in a, a productivity um, measure. And all of a sudden, the product, the work, all went back together again. <laughs> it was it was human nature at, at, at its best, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, and when I started, the uh, office visit was three dollars. And um, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Dallas Dyer was what, the founder of the group. Dallas was an incredible human being, just a great doctor, and and. Uh, we decided we wanted to raise it to five dollars, so we brought it up to the meeting. And Dallas said, "You you can't do that. You can't do that. These people, you know, they're just not going to pay it. They're going to leave. Our practice is going to go down the drain." And blah blah blah. And so we we passed it anyway, and we raised the five dollars. And at the end of the next month, uh, I asked the the office manager, "How many people have complained about the increase in price?" And she said, "No one." <laughs> They, most of the patients, the comment we got was, you guys are nuts. You've been doing this for three bucks. You're crazy. You know? <laughs> what uh, what year did you retire? Uh, 2001. What was it? What, what were you charging for an office visit then? Oh, man, I wish I remembered. Maybe 45. Uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. I, that's a guess. I don't remember for sure. But uh Anyway, the, the practice changed a lot. We, we added a lot more specialists. We, well, we always had two surgeons, two excellent surgeons. And um, we added um, cardiologists, um, allergists, um, oh, ENT, orthopedics, so forth. So it became a multi-specialty group. We got up to about 30. Um, 30 doctors uh, maximum. I, I, I ran it for a few years and, and I think I got up to 30 when I was, when I was running it. So, you know, were most of the internists general internists at the beginning? Um, yeah, I, yeah. Um, well, uh, Arch Aaron was a rheumatologist and um, uh, Jim McCool had some training in cardiology. He wasn't fully trained, but he had a year or two of it. And uh, and I had some endocrinology. So I, that was about it, I guess. Most of them were general internists. Did, did your patient population skew towards your interest in endocrinology? I'd say I, I never wanted to be straight endocrinology. I, I think my, I was probably... Um, 
60, 40, 70, 30, something like that. Mostly general internal medicine, mostly, uh, and the rest, uh, endocrinology. Um, because you had, I had to cover, you know, I had to cover the general internist on call. And uh, originally it was just two on, uh, just in pairs. And so you were on every other weekend. And, um, and we were always on every night, you know, uh, you took your own calls except on your day off. And uh, my day off was Friday, which was, which was great. So I was off every, if I was off, I was off Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if I was off the weekend and uh, had some time to do a few things. So do you, do, you, do you have any thoughts about how your ability to actually help your patients uh, over the course of your career evolved? Well, I think it evolved a lot. It's just, uh, certainly we learned a lot and had a lot of new new uh, procedures and armamentarium and medications and so forth. Uh, um, the, 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 the hum of the practice, the thing, I don't think it changed a lot. You know, the, the business end of it changed. We got into managed care and, and you know, other such things and all the insurance stuff and the, the business became much more complicated. We had to hire administrators and, and, um, and uh, so forth. But, and we built a building. Uh, when I was in charge, we, we moved from the city to the Shrewsbury. We built a 40,000 square foot uh, beautiful building that's still there. And um, that was quite, a, quite an undertaking. And, uh, we had our own, own lab. Uh, we had um, uh, our own radiology, our own um, stress testing and EKGs and so forth. Uh, so we had all that in house. So, so um, looking back, what, what do you think brought you the most joy over the years of your practice? I just, I just love taking care of people. You know, it was, uh, it's still fun. I still, still doing a little bit of it. And uh, um, I enjoyed the Southwest. Uh, there was a lot of camaraderie with the physicians. Uh, no, nobody was too proud to say, "Hey, would you come in and look at this?" I don't know what the hell it is, you know, and uh, and uh, give me your opinion on this rash or this question or whatever it is, you know. And uh, um, so it was. It was a good team. Good team. Tell me a little bit about your involvement in the college. Uh, I joined the college when I uh, when I passed my boards. I. I I passed my boards in 74, I believe it was. <clears throat> I spent I spent a whole year preparing for that. Uh, I went to the Eden Library here in Webster uh, five nights a week from about seven till 11. And uh, I took my boys with me because trying to get them to study and do their homework was almost impossible. So I, I take them to the library and they were stuck. They didn't have any other choice. So they uh, They'd uh, do their homework and work. And uh, so I passed my boards and I joined the college and I didn't get, I always went to the Missouri meeting. I think I went every year. I hardly missed a year since, since the seventies. Um, uh, but what really got me involved was about uh, maybe early nineties. The, pre the governor was a guy named Jay Morris from, it was from Kansas city. And I was mad at the college for something. And, and I honestly, God, don't remember what I was mad about, but I was venting to uh, Jay. And um, he just stood there and nodded his head, nodded his head. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand. So um, a couple of months later, I got a call from the college asking me to be on the HPPC. And um, I didn't know where that came from, you know? <laughs> and so. I got an HPPC for three years, and that was absolutely one of the best experiences I ever had in medicine. It was just incredible. And I saw Jay later, and I said, you know, Jay, I got this call from the college asking me to be on the HPPC. I just totally surprised where that came from. And he just nodded his head, <laughs> didn't say a word. <laughs> and I was too dumb to figure out that he had, he had, uh, it instigated that, but anyway, uh, it was a, it was a great experience, and um, 
we had three meetings a year in uh, Philadelphia and one meeting a year in Washington. And of course we had leadership day and started doing that then. And that's kind of what got me into it uh, in a more involved way. Got to know Bob Doherty. <laughs> just, he just, he just cheers me. I love the guy. <laughs> so, so do you, uh, you, you still interact with students at all? Do I what? Interact with students, medical students? Uh, not anymore. I, I, I very occasionally a student comes to our clinic um, up in North St. Louis, but not not on a regular basis. No, I don't. Would you still tell a student to go to medical school? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm a big advocate. Three three of my kids are physicians. Uh, what what specialties are they in? Uh, Kathy's a general internist at Kaiser in, in, in Hollywood. She's a uh, hospitalist now. Uh, Lynn is uh, pediatric infectious diseases at uh, Cook Children's in, in uh, Fort Worth. And uh, Mark is a general internist here in St. Louis. He, he joined my practice. We were partners for seven years and uh, before I retired. And so that was a special treat in medicine to work with Mark and, and, uh, and, uh, so he's still, he's still at it. And, uh, you think he's having as much fun as you did? No. Why is that? I think, I think if you had to name one thing, it'd be the EMR. It's just an absolute nightmare. <clears throat> he, uh, he often calls me on his way home just to shoot the shit. And it's 8.30, 9 o'clock. He finished seeing patients at 5 o'clock, and he's been poking away at that damn thing for three or four hours and uh and it, it it goes down frequently and he's trying to see patients and he has no records and and uh, it, it, it it to me it's taken all the fun out of it i i uh, i helped get casa de salute started uh, down at st louis you know on st louis u campus the hispanic clinic and i i i was there for about four years and they put in an emr and I lasted about three months. And I said, you know, I came home. I was seeing 12, 13 patients in an afternoon before that. And then I, I was seeing six and I was coming home, you know, like this, you know, heading for the wine bottle. And, uh, and my wife said, you know, you don't have to do this. And I said, I don't. <laughs> she said, no, I don't. don't. So, so I quit there and moved to Chips up in North St. Louis. We, we still write notes on paper, you know. So do you, do you think there's any going back? I mean, it, it, it's so it, it's so intimately tied to billing and that's of course what drives it. Do you think that's what it any, is, yeah. Do you think there's any way of going back and, and making it? I so don't see how. I don't see how. You've got you've got nothing. You know, if you turn the thing off, you have no record on any of your patients, you know. And uh, as bad as the paper records can be, uh, they're much more efficient, I hate to tell you. And uh, yeah, I'm old enough to have experienced both sides of that too. So, yeah. so um, I uh, I just wonder if there's a solution. You know, the uh, it, I would I would I, I I tend to agree with you, and so I'm I'm curious what the answer. So if 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 Biden one day says, you know, I'm tired of Fauci, I'm going to talk to Bill Fogarty and ask for his advice. What would be the what would be the single most important advice you'd give to Joe Biden? I. I I would, I know there was an EMR czar at one time. He only lasted, he gave him two years and got nothing done. <clears throat> I would appoint an EMR czar. I would have him pick a single system for the whole country, for every doctor. And I would, I would say, this system isn't perfect. It isn't even good, but we're all gonna work together to make it work for patient care, not for bean counting. And, and you would develop it over a period of weeks or months or years to, to make it what it, what it, the potential is incredible, but the actuality is horrible. And, uh, and uh, you could have it so that it would do what doctors want, not what the bean counters want. And uh, I, think, I think it could be done, but you, not if you have 500 systems or whatever there are uh, and even within, uh, before Mark left the Southwest and went with ESSA, uh, they got taken over by St. Anthony's. <clears throat> and 
St. Anthony's had a medical group with a couple hundred doctors and a hospital. They had three different EMR systems that didn't talk to each other in, inside that one group. That's insanity. You know, it just, it's just insanity. And uh, so I think that could, that could go a long way to make doctors a lot happier and, and uh, less frustrated. So one last question to close the interview. If, if, uh, if you had your life to live over again, what would you change? Uh, I'd finish my PhD. <laughs> would, I, would I then go into academic medicine and biochemical research? Um, I probably would have because I had the, you know, had the credentials, but, but would I not want to do what I did in 30 years of, of full-time practice? No, I, that's still the highlight and uh, seeing patients is still the highlight. So I wouldn't change a lot. And uh, I'm delighted that three of my kids are physicians. Uh, they have their problems, but, but they, they're all, they're all good doctors and happy. My uh, oldest grandson is a, a pediatric cardiology fellow. Now he finished his peds residency and is in peds cardiology. And one of my granddaughters is a first year medical student uh, in New York. And uh, another one is uh, another uh, grandchild's uh, heading that way. So, uh, it's all good. I, uh, well, that's, I quite a legacy. that's quite a legacy. So thank you very much, Bill. It's been a pleasure, Dan. I, I really yeah. enjoyed it.